Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SAS VIA Release Highlight Show. I'm Tiago de Souza, and today we'll be talking about what's new in SAS VIA as of April 2023. For our rundown segment, we have Sasha Karpinski highlighting Microsoft Word integration in SAS for Microsoft 365. Then we have Joe Madden with a few updates on machine learning. First, he'll tell us about a new A-Store model format for neural networks. And then he'll cover some new model auto-tuning capabilities in LightGBM and in Model Studio. Alexei Vaudilin is also back, focusing on different ways to look at your data. Alexei will cover multiple new features in SAS Studio, like data engineering steps. There are two new custom column steps, a new analyst step for ranking data, and the ability to deploy or redeploy Studio flows using SAS and Python programs. Finally, in our release talk segment, we have part two of our interview with Mary Osborne about generative AI models. But that's just an overview of everything you'll hear about today. Why don't we get right into it? I give to you the rundown. Welcome to the 2023.3 release highlights for SAS for Microsoft 365, March 2023. Today, I'm so excited to introduce SAS's integration with Microsoft Word, available on both web and desktop versions of Word. These new features make it easier than ever to share critical analytical insights from SAS with the rest of your organization. You can now view and interact with SAS visual analytics reports, insert visual insights from SAS directly into your Word documents, and update embedded SAS content with the latest SAS data, all without ever leaving your Word application. Hi. This is Joe Madden, and I have a few exciting machine learning updates to share with you for the latest release of SAS VIA. We'll kick things off with a big improvement for neural networks. We are pleased to share that the analytical store, commonly known as A Store, is now supported directly in SAS Studio, the SAS Code Node, or the SWAT Python library today, and it'll soon be available in Model Studio. A Store is our preferred format within VIA for saving and scoring a model because it's easily deployable, it's more portable, and it's faster than relying upon the traditional data step method. In this example, we have a neural net running against some simulated data. Scoring time is a scale of magnitude faster with a store compared to that data step. And even when looking at smaller data sets, significant improvement is expected. So if you've used a store for other model types, this will be just like what you're familiar with. And remember, scoring can be called from the PROC NNet and PROC a store procedure. Next, we have another evolution of the LightGBM implementation. We're pleased to announce that auto-tuning is now ready for the light grab boost action. Fans of LightGBM know it's particularly powerful when you need efficiency and scalability for large data sets, that it often includes a large number of features. Uh, so this usage is very similar to other auto-tune features, with a couple unique parameters such as bagging fraction, bagging frequency, lasso, and ridge. So let's take a look at some of those results. Just as you would see with other auto-tuning output, you're going to get a nice view into what happened at each iteration. And don't worry, if you're not a programmer, this will soon be brought into Model Studio. And speaking of Model Studio and auto-tuning, we have new output results that you're going to want to check out. In this example, we're showing gradient boosting enabled for auto-tuning set up with the genetic algorithm for its search method. The two new plots are evaluation history and iteration history. Evaluation history shows a scatter plot across iterations. Each point on the plot represents the various evaluations performed within an iteration. Iterations are denoted by color and represent unique groupings of hyperparameter values along with its results. And the solid line represents the best combination for the objective function that the auto-tune process found. The second plot, iteration history, shows how time and the objective function spans with iterations. In this case, the higher KS value shows a better model fit. As time increases, we'll see that the objective also increases. While we just have time to show this in action for Grad Boost, it works across all model types, so make sure to give it a try today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to SAS Studio Release 2023 03. In this release, we introduce a few advanced 
data engineering capabilities in SAS Studio. Let's take a look. First of all, for a table step in SAS Studio, we add support of the ability to create an output as a view. So now you can choose whether your output should be located in a physical table or it should be created in the form of view. Next, for SAS Studio Analyst, we, we introduce a new step that is called Rank Data. This step will allow you to calculate and assign rank values to your dataset. Next, we significantly extend the functionality of scheduling for SAS Studio Flows. We introduce a couple of options on SAS Studio Flows menu. First, we allow to deploy SAS Studio Flow as a job without the need to specify a scheduling trigger. And secondly, we now also allow to redeploy jobs that have been deployed previously from a specific SAS Studio Flow. This option is now also supported for SAS and Python programs in SAS Studio. Next, let's take a quick look at the extensions for Custom Steps framework. For a couple of dynamic controls that we have in Custom Steps, Input Table and Column Selector, we now allow to make these controls read-only and also allow to hide the values of these controls at runtime. Also, for a column selector control, we add an additional attribute that allows to exclude specific columns from the previous selection. These capabilities will allow custom step authors build more powerful custom steps. That was Sasha Karpinski, Joe Madden, and Alexei Vaudilin with this month's rundown. I know that the Microsoft Word integration is something a lot of users are excited about because it's such a great way to share insights from SAS via. Thanks to the three experts for coming back and being regulars on our show. Now it's time for our interview with Mary Osborne about generative AI models. I had a chance to talk with Mary last week, so let's take a look. Hey, Mary, thanks for uh, returning to the show for part two of this interview. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're, we're glad to have you. Um, I was actually out for last show, so I missed the interview entirely. Could you give us a, a recap on what you talked about? Sure. Uh, we recently released a BERT-based classifier for in SAS VIA. BERT is bidirectional encoder representations for transformers, and it is a large language model. So it's a nice addition to the rules-based approaches that we currently have in SAS Visual Text Analytics. That's awesome. So we're hearing so much about generative AI in terms of chat mm -hmm. GPT. Could you tell me a little bit more about what generative AI is? Sure. Um, in many cases, we look at generative AI as technology that, as the name would imply, generates some sort of content. So that could be images like we see in computer vision. It could be text like we would do in my domain, which is natural language processing. It could also be tabular data or data that is more structured that we see um, much more on the traditional structured machine learning standpoint. Very interesting. So what are some examples of how generative AI can impact everyday life? There are actually a, quite a few. Um, one of the one of my favorites is actually sort of the idea of teacher in the box. Um, I have children and education is something that is always top of mind. And there are some conversations happening in the market around being able to provide more personalized instruction um, through the use of generative AI. So having that teacher in a box essentially for tutoring, some additional help for uh, homework, those types of things. And there's also the idea of more personalized, um, not really marketing, uh, because people don't really love to be marketed to, um, but there's the idea of um, instead of going out to a website like Amazon, for example, and looking at reviews, which we know sometimes people are paid to do reviews, so it can be kind of difficult to determine whether or not that five-star rating and that glowing review really is accurate, being able to curate information about products. So I could go out and say, you know, I want to know what the top 10 ski, ski coats are uh, for this season. And can you give me a list of those and tell me what the pros and cons are? So instead of going to one specific vendor, being able to 
see more of a blanket approach, um, more of a general approach to marketing um, and through, through the use of things like curated lists. A lot of cool examples there. I like the, the ski coat example you gave. <laughs> uh, what are some, some business uses that you're excited about? There, um, one of my favorite examples I actually learned um, this weekend at a conference is being able to use things like synthetic data generation. So at SAS, we don't only do generative AI through large language models in the text side, but we also do play in the generative AI space on the structured tabular side. So if you are uh, a researcher and you're researching rare diseases, and maybe you only have a population of a thousand people with that rare disease. It can be really hard to model that kind of data. So in, in many cases, we need to expand the data. Traditional approaches of expanding data, random, random approaches, um, traditional statistical methods don't typically work as well as we would like. Uh, by introducing the idea of neural networks and uh, generative adversarial models, we have the ability to generate tabular data that is similar to the original data. So it gives us much a much better foundation for additional modeling. And I think that's a really interesting use case. Um, there's also, of course, all of the content related uh, use cases on the large language model side. So anything we can do to speed up uh, curation of information, um, take advantage of the technology to knock out some of the more mundane aspects of content creation, I think are benefits. Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh Generative AI in general sounds super complex, though. Could you talk about some of the key technology that is being uh, played here? Sure. I mentioned large language models and that we're supporting one right now in BERT. Um, large language models that do generative AI are, are predicated on the idea of a transformer-based architecture. Um, that was a groundbreaking uh, Development, <laughs> that's the right word, groundbreaking development uh, in, in terms of modeling and natural language processing. And it gave us a really good way to not only um, do basic things like classification, summarization, those types of things that we often think about in terms of natural language processing, but it also moved the needle further in being able to truly generate novel content. Uh, so you'll hear things about transformer models, not the Optimus Prime more than meets the eye variety, but in terms of large language models, you'll also uh, hear things like BERT, GPT, um, all of those are fall into the realm of the large language model. But on the structured side, we also support generative adversarial models for generating tabular synthetic data, as well as SMOT. Very cool. So what does the future of all of this look like in terms of natural language processing at SAS and, and beyond? What does that look like? This is something that we've put a lot of thought into, and we're going to continue to put a lot of thought into. There are a lot of concerns around generative AI. Um, there are a lot of pros and cons. And at SAS, we've always focused on developing models that people can trust and methods that people can trust. So rather than jumping all in uh, to novel generation of text, which we've seen in many use cases uh, in the media about model hallucinations, where the models go off and say things that aren't necessarily true, but they say it in a way that's believable. We want to make sure that we mitigate those types of risks before we make technology available from SAS in that domain. So we're taking a conservative approach, um, doing a lot of research. We have uh, folks in our R&D area prototyping a variety of different things um, that we hope to bring to market. But we always want to keep an eye on the feasibility. These models are really expensive to run. Um, they take a lot of compute power. So we want to make sure that whatever we generate, whatever we make available to our customers really does um, give an RO, a strong ROI, because if you're going to pay for them, you want to make sure you're getting something tangible in return. Um, we also want to make sure that we're following an ethical path. And there are a lot of discussions around ethics when it comes to generative AI and AI in general. Uh, where does the data come from? In order to train these large language models, you have to have a tremendous amount of data. And there are a lot of concerns about the way some of the um, off the shelf right now, uh, large language models are are built and pre-trained using Wikipedia and other internet-based sources, who owns that data? And are there privacy concerns? We wanna make sure that we're following the most ethical path forward. So as far as generative AI at SAS, uh, we're always going to be 
um, keeping an eye on the ethical side. And we want to make sure that whatever we produce is done um, with an eye on mitigating harm. We don't. We definitely don't want to introduce harm, uh, and doing things in a way that's really going to bring true value to our customers and reduce risk because there are a lot, there are a lot of risks uh, with generative AI. For sure, lots of points of concern there about the ethics and cost of compute, uh, but a lot to look forward to as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've been seeing more and more chat uh, chat GPT versions come out like one month to the next, so the growth on that mm -hmm. is pretty exponential. Could you talk a little bit about the rate of that growth and what the newest version offers and the the, the timeline for that? Sure. Um, ChatGPT is really fun. I mean, I think everybody has, everybody who's involved in technology has played with it in one form or another. Um, I have friends who have their grandparents now using ChatGPT to generate recipes for Sunday dinners. Uh, so we have our grandmothers and our great grandmothers involved uh, in technology, which is really, really cool. Not all the recipes are really good. So you have to take that for whatever, it, whatever it's worth. Um, but these models are here to stay. So they're not gonna go away. They're gonna continue to improve. And as OpenAI has, has released um, additional versions, so ChatGPT, the original was at, running at GPT 3.5, and they have released GPT 4, and that model is showing even more promise. So the, the research in this area is amazing. There's, there's a lot of work being put into it by uh, by so many uh, people, organizations, because there's a lot of interest in it. Um, so it's technology that's here to stay. It's not going away. Uh, it's going to continue to improve. And as long as we keep an eye on it from a, an ethical standpoint, I say the sky's the limit. Yeah, it's a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, you'd have to be a really brave one to try a chat GPT recipe for now. <laughs> Some, Some of the cooking recipes are a little questionable. Yeah, <laughs> a little sketchy, but I'm sure it'll get to the point where it'll be just chef's kiss type of stuff. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, one more question for you. Uh, for the casual chat GPT generative AI user, what are some some things that they should watch out for? Just general you know, pro tips, best practices that we should keep in mind. I think my favorite, because like I said, we're all engaging with ChatGPT. There are people that are uh, using it to generate a tremendous amount of content. Be careful. Um, there is risk. Uh, the, the models do generate really excellent sounding results. And sometimes they're not really that trustworthy. Uh, my favorite example recently, I asked ChatGPT about text-to-speech synthesis, which is an area that I find interesting, which is essentially... Um, having a machine speak like a human. So you have to think about things like inflection and tone and the rise and fall of the voice, depending on what you're talking about. So I thought it'd be interesting to see what it came back with. And it gave me a really nice explanation. I asked it to cite its sources and it came back with four papers and they all sounded believable. And it gave me links to the papers, which I thought, oh, that's really cool. So I click on the links, I get 404 not found errors. So the links are bad. So I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to search for the papers. The papers don't actually exist. So they sound plausible, but they're not real papers. They were not published works. So I asked ChatGPT, you know, where can I find this type of information on the ACL anthology, which is a really big repository of papers around computational linguistics and natural language processing. So it gave me the same paper names with ACL anthology links. When I clicked on those links, the pa it returned papers, but they weren't the papers that were cited because those papers didn't exist. Uh, so I took it one step further, last step. Um, I asked it for the authors of these invented papers. And it gave me authors that publish in the space, um, but the combinations of researchers didn't match up. Uh, and they certainly didn't write those papers because those papers don't exist. So if I had taken that information at face value, it probably wouldn't have panned out very well because none of it was real. Um, it sounded plausible though, and the titles seemed very believable. The authors that were generated are real, but not in the right combinations. So my advice is use it with caution. So always check, you know, always verify the work. Um, I, uh, I work with students and I tell them that in general, if you're going to use generative AI to do your homework, your grade is probably going to reflect the level of effort you put into it. So use it with caution. Yes. Good point. They're very good at Sounding convincing, <laughs> sounding real, sounding human when it's mm -hmm. actually 
not at all. <laughs> uh, break the fourth wall a little bit. This Mary Osborne that we have on right now is actually generated by chat GPT. We just threw in a prompt <laughs> and here she is convincing, right? <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for, for coming on the show again. And uh, we hope to have you back for another interview. In the Great. Future. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Just to clarify, that was the real Mary Osborne. AI isn't at that level yet abilities across the entire analytics lifecycle, including preparing data, creating and viewing reports, building models, automating model deployment, and visualizing event streams. So try it out today. Go to sas.com slash via for complete information and to sign up for the trial. Well, we reached the end of this month's show, but we'll be back at it again next month with more SaaS via features and updates. If you're watching this on YouTube, why not give us a like and subscribe to the SaaS users YouTube channel, click on that bell so you'll get notified for new videos and when we go live for our next show in May. Until then, comment on what topics you'd like to see in future shows. I've been your host, Tiago de Souza. That was the word for today's updates and I'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.